So welcome to calculus. So today's the second. And when we left last time, we had just uh, began talking about uh, infinite series. So that's section 12.4, infinite series. Uh, the other announcement that I forgot to say is that we have two more lectures, the one we're in and also Thursday, but we don't really have two lectures left of material. So it'll take, the, the new material will be like maybe 30 minutes into Thursday, and then the balance of Thursday we'll just use to review. So please come with any questions that you want to ask on Thursday. <coughs> okay, so infinite series. So this is the definition of an infinite series. Uh, so suppose that we're given a sequence. A n. So given a sequence, the summation A1 plus A2 plus A3 plus dot, 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 equal to the sum from I is 1 to infinity of AI. So this sum <coughs> is called an infinite series. In, that's not even close, infinite series. <clears throat> okay, now, just through historical contingency, it turns out that sequence and series and sum all start with S. And if I could go back and change <laughs> some of the history of mathematics, that would be one of the things I would change. Because so many students get confused about which is which and, and, and what is what. So a sequence a sequence a n, conceptually speaking, I encourage you to think of it like an infinite list of numbers. Infinite. Man, I'm having trouble spelling today. Infinite list of numbers. So like A1, A2, a3 dot dot dot. That's what a sequence is. What is a series? The sum of all of them. <clears throat> so a summation of the terms and sequence. Okay, <clears throat> so that's definition part one. Definition part two is that <clears throat> the sum from i is one to k of a i. So notice that this is different than that one. The, the first one 
says the sum from i is 1 to infinity. That's what that one says. So that's saying sum them all up, every one of them, all infinitely many of them. This one is saying, well, okay, actually, uh, I'm just talking about a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus dot, 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 and then we're going to stop at a k. Okay, so this is called it's called the kth, as in kth, like first, thirteenth, that kind of thing. Kth partial sum. So. The tenth partial sum is the sum of the terms a1 through a10. The millionth partial sum is the sum of the terms a1 through a1 million, etc. Okay, three. The infinite series sum i1 to infinity of ai is said to converge, so said to converge when <clears throat> the limit as k goes to infinity of the partial sum converges. So that is to say that this sum, what it means, what it actually means, the sum from i is 1 to infinity, of ai, actually is just a more compact way to write the limit as k goes to infinity of the summation from i is 1 to k of AI. I think I probably said it last time. I hope this reminds you of something. Does this remind you of anything that we did earlier in the semester? Of what? Improper integrals. integrals. Yeah, improper integrals, right? Because remember that you know, this is just this is just I'm going to write something that's not part of of the definition, but I'm going to write it so that you can compare it conceptually, so I'll write it in green. So our definition of this improper integral, say integral from 0 to infinity of f of x dx, the fact that we're integrating from 0 to infinity means that the region that that describes is not proper because you can't draw a circle around it because it goes all the way to the right. Okay? This, this region goes all the way to positive infinity. So the way that we handled it is we said, OK, we'll just cut it at some posi position B, some rightmost position B. And then the, that region is proper. We could draw a circle around it. We integrate from 0 to B, and then compute limit as B goes to infinity. So this is exactly the same technique. So again, the green is not, not related to the definition of, of infinite series, but cons I hope that you see that the concept is really quite similar. This is a B. This? That's a B. A B. <clears throat> so what we're saying for the infinite sum, you cut it at the kth term and then let k go to infinity. For the integral, we're saying you cut it at b, and then let b go to infinity. So it's really conceptually quite similar. OK, so any question about just the definitions? Now, we haven't done any examples. It'll get more clear when we do a few examples. But until that point, is there any question about the definitions? <clears throat> OK. <clears throat> So 
So let's do a really boring one. Let's do a couple really boring ones. So how about uh, a n is 0. So a sequence where every single term is 0. The first term is 0. The tenth term is 0. The 138th term is 0. They're all 0. <coughs> Okay, so we'll let this be the case. Want to find the summation from i is 1 to k of ai and the summation from i is 1 to infinity of ai. So find the kth partial sum and find the, find the series, the whole series. Okay, so the sum from i is 1 to k of ai, of ai. So what would that be? Z right, because it would be, it would be 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus dot 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 up to zero. And how many zeros did we add together? Infinity many zeros. Well, to be, to be exact, that was k of them. Okay. And what do you get if you add together k zeros? You get zero. So the kth partial sum is zero. And so then what is the limit of the kth partial sum? So the sum from i is 1 to infinity now of ai, that is by definition the limit as k goes to infinity of the sum from i is 1 to k of ai. So that's its definition. In the line immediately above, we figured out what goes in the round parentheses. Zero. So this is the limit as k goes to infinity of 0. And what's that limit? <coughs> 0, right? So this, this question is sort of, this first, this first one is deceptively, not, not even deceptively, just outright easy. Okay, it's, it's 0. Any question about this one? OK. How about let's let let's let b n be uh, three, right? So now instead of instead of all the terms being zero, now all the terms are three. Every one of them is three. Even the third one. The third one is three. I want you to find. The kth partial sum and the infinite series. So for the kth partial sum, that means we're going to add up the first k terms. Well, what's the first term? 3. What's the next one? And what's the one after that? OK, right. I remember now they're all 3. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last one is 3. So if we add up that many of them, then what's the, the answer? 3k. Why is that the case? Right, so how many, how many threes showed up? There were k threes.
So how many times did three show up? K times. K times, right? Which is, which is where that language comes from, three times K. So three K. So for example, the 10th partial sum is 30. Okay, the, how about this one? The sum from I is one uh, to infinity of bi. Well, by definition, that is the limit as k goes to infinity of the sum from i is 1 to k of bi. So that is the limit as k goes to infinity of 3k. And what's that? Infinity. Infinite, right? It diverges. So how much would you have <laughs> if you took, you know, if you had infinitely many many steps where you where you were collecting three rocks, you got three rocks and you got three more rocks and three more rocks, and you did that infinitely many times, how many would you have? Infinitely many, right? A lot, <laughs> too many. Okay, so now um, this actually is the whole story for every constant sequence. If the if the sequence has the constant value zero then all of its partial sums are zero, and the series is zero. If the sequence has a non-zero constant value, say a, then the kth partial sum is a k, a multiplied by k, and the series is infinite, either positive infinite or negative infinite, depending on whether or not a was negative or positive. Okay, so, what about, if, what about if bn was a small number? Like if bn was, say, 0 0.01, then what's the series? It, it would be, that would be the kth partial sum. How about the series, the infinite sum? Infinite, right? Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that it's small, right? Because you've got infinitely many of them, right? How much money would you have if you had infinitely many pennies? <laughs> An infinite amount, right? Okay, good. Any question about this? So now we need we want to branch out. Um, <clears throat> no, because like a penny is a fraction of a dollar. As far as constant sequences are concerned, the only constant sequence that has a series equal to zero is the zero sequence. So all of the rest of them diverge either to positive or negative infinite. So now these, these ones are boring, this, the constant sequences. We want to branch out beyond this. And in the wide world of science and math, there is a, a, a great multitude of different kinds of series and sequences that mathematicians and scientists are interested in. However, in our class, we're going to only be interested in geometric sequences and series. So only the geometric variety. But I don't want you to be misled and think that that's, that's all there is to it. Because there's a lot of different kinds of, of sequences and series. Just in our class, we're only talking about the geometric variety. So before we talk about the geometric variety, I want to make one comment, and that is that uh, this is a comment about the starting index. So in, in various places, so in our, uh, in our class, we typically write this, the sum from i is 1 to infinity of ai, and that means a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus dot, dot, dot. It means all of them. But there's nothing sacred or special about starting at 1, right? You could, you could have a different series, and you could say, well, I'm talking about the sum from i is uh, 12 to infinity of bi, and that would be b12 plus b13 
plus b14 plus dot dot dot. So there's nothing sacred about starting at one. Okay, we just, in our, in our class, we basically almost always arrange it to where we start at one. But there's nothing sacred about that. <clears throat> okay, so now let's get to geometric um, sequences and series. So here's a proposition. about geometric metric sequences and series. So we actually know the, the vast majority of everything we need to know because if we say let a n be geometric sequence, then we already know that a n can be expressed as standard, in standard form as a multiplied by r to n minus 1. Okay, but there are some conditions on a and r. <clears throat> so what are the conditions on a and r? Uh, cannot be zero. What cannot be 0? A cannot equal zero, R cannot equal zero, and A cannot equal one. Almost. That's that's pretty close. So A can't be zero, R can't be zero, and R cannot be one. Is it different from what we're doing right now? No, it should be the same. I wrote it wrong. Or I wrote it wrong. But <laughs> somehow it was misrecorded. What's the what's the purpose of these three conditions? What do they what do they guarantee you about the sequence? that it's not constant, right? Because if A was zero, then every term in the sequence would be zero. And that would be a constant sequence. If R was zero, then every term in the sequence would be zero. And it would be a constant sequence. If R was one, then that would be one to some exponent, which is just one, and every term would be A, which is constant, and it would be a constant sequence. So these three conditions guarantee that the sequence is non-constant. Now, <clears throat> we didn't have the terminology for it at the time that we established it, but we do have a formula for the sum of the first k terms of a geometric sequence. Remember, we, we established that formula. That's how we came up with um, uh, annuity, formulas, that's how we did all that stuff. So the kth partial sum sum from i is 1 to k of a multiplied by r to i minus 1 that is to say, so when you plug in i is 1, what is the first term? So it would be, it would be a multiplied by r to what exponent? Zero, right? So and r to 0 is 1. So this would be a plus, what's the next term? Right, so a, r, and then what's the next term? a, r, squared, and the next term is a, r, cubed, and then what's the last term? To k, to k minus 1. Okay, the partial sum, we, have a, we established a formula for this. We said, we, we established that it was a multiplied by r to k minus 1 divided by r minus 1. So, okay. In dealing with geometric series, we already know this. We already know what a geometric sequence is, and we already know the formula for the kth partial sum.
<coughs> and we want to know <coughs> when does the limit as k go to infinity of this exist? That is to say, when will, when will a geometric series converge? So now, let's do a thought experiment. So we did the, we did the, the beer thought experiment, right? The mathematicians ordering beer one. So imagine, let, let's do it in reverse order now. And let's say, suppose that we have two pitchers into which we will pour beer. And that we're doing this in steps. And it is all, the, the, the request is always, I want you to pour half of the remaining volume. So in the first step, you have two open pitchers. Person says, I want half of the remaining volume. So bartender pours one. Now you have one open. Next person says, I want half of the remaining volume. Bartender pours half. So now you have one and a half. Next mathematician says, I want half of the remaining volume. So the bartender pours a quarter of a pitcher. And now you have one and three quarters pitchers. And then the next one says half. And the next one says half. And the next one says half. So when you, when you carry this procedure out to, to infinity, what will be the state of the pitchers? They'll be full, right? Both of them full. So the summation of that, the series, that geometric series, it, the answer is two. Okay. So at least in principle, it seems that some geometric series should converge because the beer example is an example that converges to two. Now let's do the rice example. So this is an apoc another apocryphal story. So the story goes like uh, something like once there was a peasant who in a kingdom who through some action one way or another saved the king's life. And the king said, peasant, you can have uh, anything that you wish, any reasonable thing that you wish. And the peasant looks over at the king's chessboard, the game, from the game chess, and says, okay, king, I would like for you to, to take that chessboard and give me one grain of rice on the first square and give me two grains of rice on the second square and four grains of rice on the next square. And I just want you to double the number of grains of rice for each one of the squares. And the king thinks, oh yeah, that's totally reasonable. Yeah, we'll do that. Okay, so then how many squares are on a chessboard? 64, right? Because a chessboard is eight by eight. So there's 64 of them. So you will double the number of grains of rice um, 63 times, right? So you start with the one, and then you double it 63 more times. So on the last square, on the last square, king needs to put 2 to 63 grains of rice. So that's a 9 with 18 zeros behind it. And that is an inconceivably large amount of rice. You know, that, that's like rivaling the mass of the planet, quantities of rice. Okay, maybe, maybe more than that. I, you know, you should, you should calculate it out, right? So, <clears throat> just for, for giggles. Okay, so now, that's a lot of rice. Okay. Now, suppose that you wanted to compute the not the partial sum, but the series, all the way to infinity. How much rice would you have if you carried this out? At every step, you were given twice as much rice as you had previously. How much rice would you have in the end? An infinite amount, right? Which, that doesn't converge. So I've given you an example of a geometric series which does converge, and it converges to two, the beer example. And I've given you an example of a geometric series that does not converge, the rice example. Okay. So, 
what we want to do now in this proposition is we want to establish exactly when does a geometric series converge and exactly what does it converge to when it does converge. So when does it converge and what does it converge to? It'll be something like that. Okay, so when does it exist? So notice that of these terms, uh, of the various terms and factors in this expression, a, th this, does, this a by itself doesn't depend on k. This, this r doesn't depend on k. This one doesn't depend on k. That one doesn't depend on k. The only part of this expression that actually depends on k is this, r to k. That's the, that is what governs the behavior of the geometric sum. So this question, when does the limit of that exist, is equivalent to asking, when does the limit as k go to infinity of r to k exist? So what we're going to do is we're going to run through all the possibilities. So the first one I'm going to ask about, what about, what about the case when r is 1? What about the case when r is equal to 1? So this, this is a kind of a trick question a little bit. What do you mean it doesn't? Okay. E even even before any of that. Wouldn't that make it a constant? Yeah. This is this is prohibited, right? At the very top of the page, we said that no, no, that's not going to happen. We're not having that. So this is prohibited by that. Okay, what about the case when r is greater than 1? What, would, what does r to k do? It goes to infinity, right? So that's an example of such a ratio, r is 2. What is 2 to k? So by way of example, what does 2 to k do as k goes to infinity? It goes to infinity. This is just like the rice. So in this case, <coughs> this diverges. OK. <coughs> what about? What about when the absolute value of r is less than 1? So which is to say, a, a different way, negative 1 is less than r is less than 1. So what about that? It's going to converge. So an, an example of this would be half to k. So what does half to k do? as k becomes, as k goes to infinity. Smaller and smaller. So not only does it converge, you should be able to tell me what it converges to. So if you took a pizza, you cut it in half, you'd have half a pizza. And if you took that and cut it in half, you'd have a fourth of a pizza. And if you took that and cut it in half, you'd have an eighth of a pizza. And if you carried out this procedure to infinity, how much pizza would you have? You'd have none, right? <laughs> After you carried it out, what, what would remain? It would have to be none, because if something, if something did remain, that would mean that you neglected to cut it in half one of those times. <laughs> so this goes to 0 as k goes to infinity. Now what about, that's, that's in the positive case. That's, a, that's in the positive case. Notice that we're saying that 
r can be negative. It just needs to be between negative 1 and 1. What about like negative half to k? And this is a little more disturbing because you can't cut a pizza in negative half. I'm not sure what that would mean. Sorry, you vomit? Okay, that's lovely. <laughs> so what about numerically? <laughs> I like it. What about numerically? Uh, negative half to k, what does that do as k goes to infinity? Same thing. But it, it does the same thing, but in a slightly different way. So, for example, the terms would be, so at k is 1, the terms would be negative half. What would the next term be? Positive 1 fourth. What would be the next term? Negative 1 eighth. What would be the next term? Positive a sixteenth. So, the terms are alternating SIGN, right? From between positive and negative. But their magnitude is getting small, right? The magnitude is getting small. So that alternatingness, that alternatingness doesn't actually cause a problem in the end because even though it's alternating between positive and negative, it's getting closer and closer to zero all the time. So this is also going to zero as k goes to infinity. So the conclusion for this case, for case number three, is that uh, r to k goes to zero as k goes to infinity. Okay, what about the case when r is negative one? So notice that the terms will still be alternating, right? So negative 1 to k is what it would look like. So what are the terms then? Negative 1 and then positive 1 and then negative 1 and then positive 1. Does it go to 0? It doesn't, right? These get smaller and smaller in magnitude. But these, this is just alternating between negative 1 and 1. So it doesn't ever converge to anything. It doesn't ever get arbitrarily close to just one number. Okay, so this diverges. And the last case is that what if r is less than negative 1? Then what? So an, an example of this would be something like, say, negative uh, 3 to k. So it'll be, it, it's not quite that. It's it's almost, it's not quite though, it's, it's not, because what's the first term? Negative 3, what's the next term? 9. 9, what's the next term? Negative 27, what's the next term? 81. <laughs> and so the SIGN of the terms is alternating between positive and negative infinity. By the way, the reason why I'm saying S-I-G-N is because I don't want it to be confused with S-I-N-E, like sine and cosine. So, you know, every other term is negative, every other term is positive, and they're getting larger and larger in magnitude all the time. So it's sort of wildly going up and down. Yeah, so this diverges. <coughs> Now, there are no other possibilities. We've covered them all. Okay? So which possibilities converge? Yeah, just that one. So not this one, not this one, not this one, 
not this one. Just this one. <clears throat> okay, so this is the only, the only case uh, for which um, a geometric series will converge. Now, does this agree with the beer and the rice examples? So why, so the beer example, did we, did we conclude converge or diverge? Converge. What was the ratio in the beer example? Half. Okay. What about in the rice example? Did we conclude converge or diverge? Diverge. What was the ratio in the rice example? Two. Is that in agreement with what we have written on the page? Yes. Okay. In order to converge, we need the ratio to be between negative one and positive one. Okay, so continuing this. So therefore, um, R to K converges exactly when the absolute value of R is less than 1. And by that I mean the R to K that we're talking about, this, this R to K up here. But we're actually not interested in that. Specific, specifically, what we were interested in was this. A R to K minus 1 over R minus 1. This converges. <coughs> when the absolute value of R is less than 1. <coughs> and now we can make our conclusion. So the sum from I is 1 to infinity of A multiplied by R to I minus 1 so the geometric series that we're interested in is the limit as k goes to infinity of the partial sum which is the limit And assuming that R, the absolute value of R is between negative 1 and 1, this is the only term that does anything. So that goes to A, that goes to R, that goes to 1, that goes to 1. What does that term do? R to K. K goes to infinity, but what does R to K do, assuming that R is between negative 1 and 1? It goes to 0. So this would be a multiplied by 0 minus 1 over r minus 1. This is when absolute value of r is less than 1. OK, now this expression can be simplified a little bit. So that would be negative a over r minus 1. Now, uh, the denominator, I'm going to do one quick thing with the denominator. So if you had an expression x minus y, x minus y, and you negated x minus y, then what would the new expression be? It would be negative x plus y, but then you could rewrite it and say y minus x. So the negation of x minus y is y minus x. The negation of s minus t is t minus s. So I'm going to spend this negative in the numerator on the denominator and negate the denominator. When I do that, then what? It will be a over 1 minus r. So this, a plus a r plus a r squared plus dot, 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 this is a formula that you must now memorize.
So you don't need to know the reason why this is the formula. It'd be good, it'd be good to know the reason why this is the formula, but in principle you don't <laughs> in principle to, to gain the points on the exercises you don't need to know. Yes, when the absolute value of r is less than 1. <clears throat> so a over 1 minus a. Okay, so here's a formula. So now let's do the, let's do the beer example. Okay, let's say, uh, let's say this. So we want one pitcher of beer plus half of what the previous person asked for plus half of what the previous person asked for plus etc. So we already know because of our previous considerations that this answer should be two. Should be two. And then we just went through and established a formula. So this, the formula ought to agree with our previous considerations. So to find this in to, to evaluate this expression, in the end, what you need to do is find A and R. Okay, so A is pretty easy. What's A? One, <laughs> right? A is the first term. Okay, I found it. Okay, R is slightly more complicated. How do you find R? So what's R? Yeah, it's just half. OK, so it's not much more complicated. OK, and then the formula, what's the, what's the formula in terms of letters A and R? A over 1 minus R. So I'm going to say A over 1 minus R as many times as possible today because when I say A over 1 minus R one more time, that increases the likelihood that you're going to remember that the formula is A over 1 minus R. <laughs> that was a little forced. OK. No, no. I like it. repetition. OK, so then 1 over 1 minus half. So 1 minus half is half. So that's 1 over half. And division by a fraction is the same as multiplication by it's reciprocal, so this is two. So is that is that in agreement with the beer story? Sure, right. Okay, good. Any question about this one? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you have something to attach it to. <laughs> okay. So how about um, how about Uh, please find the sum 27 plus 9 plus 3 plus 1 plus dot, dot, dot. So in the end, it's just like the previous exercise. It, it's the same as the previous exercise in every detail, except the, in every major detail, except the numbers are different. So in the end, you need to find A and R. So what's A? 27, the first term. What's R? A third, right? So generally speaking, just to make sure everyone remembers, the ratio R is always the ratio of consecutive terms. So that is to say, you take some term, say A3, and you divide it by the previous term, A2. So what's the third term? Well, that'd be one, that one, three. 
And then what's the term before 3? 9. So that's a third. So the ratio is a third. Notice that it works for any pair of them, right? 9 over 27, a third. 3 over 9, a third. 1 over 3, a third. Okay? So then the formula, that's, uh, what was it? <laughs> what enthusiasm. <laughs> hey, I'm rolling my ass. <laughs> okay. We haven't had a joke in like a month. Come on. It has been a long time. Oh, don't worry, I've got one. Oh. It's coming. <laughs> okay, so then that would be uh, what? 27 over 2 thirds. So division by 2 thirds is the same as what? by three halves, so that'd be 81 over two. Okay, any question about this one? Right, yes. Except I'm gonna, I'm gonna change it up a little bit now si since you said that. <laughs> okay, how about this sum? from i is 0 now to infinity of, uh, how about um, 8 over 5 to i. to i, 5 with exponent i. So it might help a little bit for you to think about what this, this is, okay? What, what would be the first term when you plug in the first i? Eight. It'd be 8. And what would be the next one? <laughs> 8 over 5, right? And what would be the next one? 8 over, and I'm going to write 5 squared. And the next one would be 8 over 5 cubed, and then plus dot, dot, dot. Okay, so the sigma, sigma notation is just another way to write uh, those, th these sums. Okay, it's a little more compact horizontally. So what do you think? What would be A? 8. What would be R? One fifth. Right? Many many students, when they look at this kind of example for the first time, they say uh, they might say, "I think R is five. Why is that not right? Because it's in the denominator. Right. Okay. So I'll say it like this. In a geometric sequence, when, when you move one term to the right, you always have to multiply, multiply by r to move one term to the right. So when, you, when you're moving to the right, are you multiplying by 5? No, you're dividing by 5. So how can you say dividing by 5? There you have it, multiplying by a fifth. So every time you move one term to the right, you're multiplying by a fifth. So I could rewrite this just slightly and say, well, this is 8 plus 8 multiplied by a fifth plus 8 multiplied by a fifth squared plus 8 multiplied by a fifth cubed plus dot, dot, dot. And hopefully, if you were on the fence of what it was supposed to be before, hopefully you see it clearly now. Okay, so what is, what is A then? Eight. And what is R? One-fifth. 
So does this series converge? Yes. <coughs> uh, so it would be A over 1 minus R, because that's the good old A over 1 minus R formula. So that would be 8 over 1 minus a fifth. 1 minus a fifth is 4 fifths. Division by 4 fifths is multiplication by 5 fourths. So that'd be 10. <clears throat> Isn't that an interesting way to write 10? First, I want you to take 8, and then I want you to add 8 fifths. And then I want you to add, <laughs> I want you to add 8 twenty fifths, and then add 8 one hundred and twenty fifths. And carry that out, and you get 10. <laughs> <laughs> like, like the beer example. This would be like paying ten. Like, what's the point of this? Like, where? What does this mean? I get it now. Good. Like the beer example. Like, eventually, it's just gonna <clears throat> converge on. It's, it'll never be greater than ten. I get it. Good. Check. Okay. Other questions, comments. <laughs> yeah, mine are really. <laughs> okay. What about? What about? Um, E plus E squared plus E cubed plus E to 4 plus dot, 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 where E is the natural number. What's the question? I'm sorry. Um, what, is this, what is this sum? Determine the answer where E is the natural number. So by the way, what, what is approximately the numeric value of the natural number? 2.7 something, something, something. OK. So is this a geometric series? If it is, you should be able to tell me A and R. It's not a geometric series? Is it one? I'm asking if it is. And I'm saying no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I get it. No, it, it, it is one. Okay. It, it is one. I'm like, I don't know. Yes. So you could write this as E plus E multiplied by E plus E multiplied by E squared plus E multiplied by E cubed plus dot, dot, dot. So what's the first term? E, so that's A, is E. And what's the ratio? E. e. Okay, so then is the formula A over 1 minus R? Yes. Yeah. No. Why is the formula not A over 1 minus R? Because E is greater than 1. Oh. Does this converge? No, this diverges. This diverges because the ratio is too big. Now, this diverges. Now, what if, what if you were to, say, get in a rush or in a fluster or whatever on the exam, and you were to just say, you know what, I'm just going to do A over 1 minus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Okay? And if you were to just do it anyway. <laughs> A over 1 minus R. So this would be E over 1 minus E. So type that into your calculator real quick. No. <laughs> it's just going to say no. <laughs> I, ref I refuse. So my calculator is reporting negative 1.5 eight to zero if I round to four places past the decimal. And there is something seriously and majorly wrong with that. What's that? Okay, that, that's what's wrong with using that as a ratio. But as this number, so what, what this would be saying, if this was right, it'd be saying that that you're claiming that if you... If, oh, adding them up, you can make it a negative number, which is impossible. Right. Consider E. 
E is about 2.7. Right, so adding up all these positive numbers. As a result of adding up all these positive numbers, I get negative 1.58 something, something, something. I mean, I mean, imagine what that means. You're saying like, okay, well, yeah, I got, I got you know, paid a dollar, and then I got paid two dollars, and I got paid all these positive sums of money. And as a result of this, okay, I have negative four dollars. <laughs> Taxes. Okay, well, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So how about another one? So please find the sum of two ninths minus four. Yeah, the answer is diverges. Right. Correct. You say it diverges by when when you note this. Yeah. Okay, then plus 8 over 81, and then uh, minus um, 16 over 243, and then plus dot, dot, dot. We just talked about this, didn't we? We did? <clears throat> I didn't do this one, I think. It diverges because this is, the ratio is greater than 1. The ratio is too big on the previous example. <clears throat> so how about this one? Divergence. Hey, what's your reason? So let's just let's step back just a little bit and does everyone agree that at least we need to find A and R? Yeah. <laughs> right? So we're all So A is 2 over 9. What's R? It should be negative 2. Well, it should be the ratio of two consecutive terms. So which one do you want to be in the numerator? Okay, it would have to be negative 4 27ths. Okay, and then the one before it has to be in the denominator, so over 2 ninths. So division by a fraction is the same as multiplication by its reciprocal, so this would be negative 4 over 27 multiplied by 9 over 2. So the 4 and 2 cancel with a 2 in the numerator, the 9 and 27 cancel with a 3 in the denominator. So the ratio is negative two-thirds. Ah, negative ratio, that diverges, right? No, because it's, it would be negative one and one. Right, so the, the condition is that the ratio needs to be between negative one and one. Is negative two-thirds between negative one and one? Yeah. Okay, so this converges, and moreover, you know what it converges to. It converges with this formula, a over 1 minus r, good old a over 1 minus r, 2 ninths divided by 1 minus negative 2 thirds. So 1 minus negative 2 thirds, that's 1 plus um, 2 thirds. So that'd be 5 thirds. So that'd be 2 ninths uh, multiplied by 3 fifths, like this. I can't do that much in my head. Is that right? Okay, 6 over 45. <laughs> Which would be what? 1 over 9? No. I don't know. Something's, something's not... Ah, thank you. 2 over 15. Okay, good. So, two, 2 over 15. Terrific. Any question about this one? <clears throat> Okay, so now we're going to do a word problem. Oh, oh <laughs> such <laughs> excitement. Please get the unison, guys. We could have done that better. No, I don't think so, though. This isn't a good time for that.
Oh, we're going to do it. It's going to be, it's part of the joke. I'm still hungry. Oh, pizza is part of the, yeah, I'm pretty hungry. So I might have last one. It's 2 over 15. What if you write 0.133 with the variation? That's fine, as long as it's right. Yeah. As long, you know, like one third is, you know, contrary to some people's popular opinion, one third is not exactly equal to 0 0.333. There's infinitely many of those threes. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. <clears throat> so we're gonna do we're gonna do a word problem that is also at the same time a joke, a little bit. It's a, it's a historic <laughs> it's a historical joke. Okay. So this is the this is the um, is it is it a very famous word word problem when you're talking about geometric series. So there's two trains and they're on a track and they're facing each other and they start out at 100 kilometers apart and they're traveling toward each other each at 50 kilometers per hour so they're and they're and they're going to collide they're on a collision course uh, when, when the time starts uh, they're 100 kilometers apart each traveling 50 kilometers per hour there's a fly on the first train or some kind of whatever a fly it's traveling at 75 kilometers per hour, so it's traveling even faster than the train. And if it goes from the first train to the second train, as soon as it touches the second train, it turns around, and without losing any speed, but going in exactly the opposite direction, flies toward the first train again. And then it touches the first train, and turns around and flies toward the second train. And all this time, it's, it's flying back and forth. Back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth. And what we're going to address is just how far, just how far does the fly travel uh, until the trains collide? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Why is this historic? We got it. We're, we'll get to it. Okay, so this is the, I'll just write the train exercise. What? People used to be weird. No, nothing, nothing has changed. I mean, have you gotten onto Twitter lately? <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> okay. So we've got a, we've got a, idealized track here. This is 100 kilometers. At position zero, I'll say we've got the red train. The red train is traveling to the right. And, well, that is, that is a train. It's just far away. That's all you can see. <laughs> and this is the green train. Oh, or it's a dot, yeah. And it's traveling to the left. The, the red train is traveling to the right at 50 kilometers an hour. The, the green train to the left at 50 kilometers an hour. And then with exactly at time zero, there's a fly and it's traveling at 75 kilometers an hour to the right. Okay, so now what we want is we want to make formulas for the positions of all three objects in the system as functions of time. Okay, so the red point, I'll call it X's, so, and I'm going to write one because I want to know, because this is, we're going to figure out up to the first collision. The first collision? There's going to be more than one? The first collision of the fly with the other train. Oh, I thought you meant the first collision of the train. Wow. <laughs> this is exciting. <laughs> it's very exciting. Okay, so X1, where, so where does it start? I said it aloud. Where does, mm -hmm. It starts at zero. And how it's traveling 50 kilometers per hour to the right. So its position as a function of time is 50 multiplied by T. 
So 50 kilometers per hour multiplied by t, the number of hours. Okay, so that's its position. What's the position of the fly? Zero. Uh, okay, good. So I'll write, um, I'll call the fly's position z, one. So it's starting at position zero. And then as a function of time, what's its position? 75t. 75t. Okay, good. <clears throat> and the other train's position. So I'll call this y1 of t. Well, what's its initial position? 100. 100. And it's traveling to the left at 50 kilometers an hour. So what will be its position as a function of time? Uh, yes, 100 minus 50t. Okay, so the first event, <clears throat> the first event is when the blue fly hits the green train, right? They're all, the, the particles are all moving. So we want to know, when does, the, when does the blue fly hit the green train? What, what do we need to algebraically solve for? Set what equal to each other? 75t plus 100 minus 50 Good. So collision 1. Are we going to find that because there were the units? Is there going to be a formula at the end? Yes, but we're gonna ha we, have to we have to work our way through it. Okay. So 75t is equal to 100 minus 50t. And we want to solve for t. So that would be 125 t is 100. And we could solve that by dividing both sides by 125. You get 4 over 5. So 4, four over 5. Uh, how far did the fly travel in that time? So for 4 fifths of an hour, the fly was traveling how fast? 75 miles an hour. 75 miles an hour. So it'd be 75. Or yeah, kilometers. Okay, four over five. So 75 times four fifths is 60. So at the time of the first collision, the fly had traveled 60 kilometers. And, it, and immediately at that instant, the fly turns around and is flying 75 away from the green train and toward the red train. So let's draw that. Now we need to figure out um, <clears throat> the functions for each one. So now, x2. So at the time of the first collision, where was the red train? At 40 kilometers. Because, because the first collision happened at time 4 fifths and the train was traveling 50t, that was its position. So you plug in 4 fifths, 50 times 4 fifths is 40. So that's its initial position. And then it's, it's also moving, so its position in time will be 40 plus 50t. So that's the position of the red train. What's the position of the green train? <clears throat> Yes, 60 minus 50t. So it's minus 50t because it's moving 50 kilometers per hour to the left, but how did you get 60? Uh, because that's where the collision happened. Yeah, so, so we knew the collision happened at 60. Alternatively, you could have plugged in 4 fifths into this. 
and that would have worked also. So then the green, or sorry, the blue fly, Z2, its position is also 60. So what is its position? Its initial position is 60. So what's its position as a function of time? Minus 75T. Okay, now what event are we looking for? When it collides with the red train. So collision two, and algebraically, what do we need to solve? Yes. So that would be 40 plus 50t is equal to 60 minus 75t. So then that would be 125t is 20, moving the t's to one side and the things without t's to the other side. If you solve for t, then what do you get? 4 over 25, except I'm going to write 4 over 5 squared. Why do you suppose I'm going to write 4 over 5 squared? Right, because the first one was... <laughs> the first one was 4 over 5. The first time. The second time was 4 over 5 squared. What do you suppose the next time is going to be? 4 over 5 cubed. Okay, good. Oh, we're going to do it one more time. Right, two's, two's not a pattern. Right. Uh, so, so how far did the did the did the fly travel in that amount of time? Well, it'd be seventy-five miles per hour multiplied by four over five squared. The amount of time that it it flew at that speed. Uh, no. Almost. What'd you say? Seventy-five. 4 over 5 squared. Oh, 12. Good. So the first, the first, before the first collision, the fly traveled 60. Before the second collision, the fly traveled 12. What do you think the fly is going to travel before the, ne before the next collision? Yes, <laughs> 12 over 5, right? The first one was 60. The next one was 60 over 5. The next one's going to be 60 over 5 squared, which is 2.4. OK, let's do one more of them. <laughs> the, the, the intrigue is, and mystery is all gone. Okay, so the red train is still traveling to the right. The left train is still, the green train is still traveling to the left. The fly is now traveling to the right. <clears throat> Let's find formulas for each of these. So the red train it's, it's almost the same, but they're, they're coming together. Right? So um, what's the formula for the red train, the red train's position? Not quite. So this one would be 52. What's, uh, what's this one? 48. 48. So 48. So why is it 48? Because you could take this t over 4, t over 25, I'm oh, oh. sorry, 4 over 25 and plug it in here. Um, good. Uh, alternatively, right, this was 60, and how far did the fly travel? 12. So 60 minus 12 is 48. There's a, there's a variety of reasons why it's the case. Okay, how about the green, the green train? What's its position function? So that'd be 52 minus 50t. Okay, and then what's the fly's position function? Good. Okay. 
Okay, and what event are we trying to calculate? When it collides with the next right, the next collision. So collision three. Well, that occurs when 48 plus 75t is 52 minus 50t. And so that's 125t is equal to 4. And so the third collision occurs at 4 over 5 cubed. And the distance traveled is d3 is equal to 12 over 5. <clears throat> Okay, so I hope we've gone through this quite tedious construction. Does everyone see that it's being set up as a geometric series? So what we want is we want to find the sum d1 plus d2 plus d3 plus dot, 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 which is 60 plus 60 times a fifth. That's 12 plus 60 times a fifth squared, that's 2.4, plus dot, dot, dot. <clears throat> okay, so then do you observe, ah, it's a geometric series. Wh what is A and what is R? A is 60, R is 1 fifth. Good. So this would be 60 over 1 minus a fifth. And what is that? Uh, are you talking about the number? Or yeah. 75? When you, 75. Now, I claim that, that the answer 75 is totally obvious. Why is that totally obvious? Oh, because he's going 75 kilometers per hour. Right. And, and how long does it take? two trains, each one traveling 50 kilometers per hour. It takes them an hour. <laughs> it takes them an hour. When are they going to collide? In an hour. How long was the fly traveling? An hour. For an hour. How fast was it traveling? 75, 75 kilometers per hour. Yeah. Of course it traveled 75 kilometers. Okay. Unfortunately, that's the joke. Right? <laughs> <laughs> is that... Is that why did you do the geometric series in the first place? <laughs> Whose idea was yeah. that? <laughs> why did we do that? So this actually, this actually is the subject of a real, a real historical event in, um, in the, tel the telling of this joke <laughs> is what I, it actually really happened. So there was a, there was a very famous mathematician um, named John von Neumann. And you might have heard of him, maybe. But at any rate, he was one of the, for example, he was one of the people who worked at Los Alamos on the Manhattan Project and, and got the US nuclear arsenal started. This dude was a really clever person. And uh, he had this, he had this uh, ability that many people commented, commented on, because he ended up meeting a lot of people. A lot of people met him. He could compute really, really fast in his head. Like things that, you know, like you're, he, he, on many tasks, he would be more apt than your, you with your calculator, or me with my calculator for that matter. So at any rate, someone tells him this story and says, there's a train and, and fly and everything else. And then as soon as someone says, how far did the fly travel? He waited about, you know, half of a second and said, 75 kilometers. And the, and the jokester says, oh, you've already heard this one and you knew you didn't have to do a geometric series. And von Neumann replied, well, I did do a geometric series. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I wish I could have met him. He must have been an incredible person. Yes. <clears throat> okay, good. But at, on the other hand, this, of course, this story is completely unfeasible, right? For a variety of reasons. One reason it's completely unfeasible is that, okay, if this fly, okay, was doing this and changing its position, changing its direction so quick, at one point it would be oscillating faster than the frequency of a gamma ray, right? <laughs> and it, it would, like, 
the, the universe around it would be being destroyed from how fast it's oscillating. It's totally ridiculous. So, <laughs> any question about geometric series? <laughs> yeah, so this, this kind of thing can be couched in all kinds of silliness. Like you could say, well, suppose you have a bouncy ball and its initial bounce is 100 centimeters. And this bouncy ball has the property that it can always bounce 90% of its former height. So that the first bounce, it goes up 100 centimeters and then down 100 centimeters. And then its second bounce, it goes up 90 centimeters and then down 90 centimeters. And then it goes up 81 centimeters because that's 90% of 90 and then down another 81. How many centimeters all told does it go up and down? Bounce, 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 bounce. It's a geometric series question. It's, it's exactly as exciting as it sounds. <laughs> okay, good. So any question about geometric series? <laughs> no, we're going to do something that's actually interesting to me now. <clears throat> I mean, ge geometric series are, are okay, but... <clears throat> but so we're, we're moving beyond geometric series, but keep in mind, okay, for those of you that are interested in moving on further in science and math and stuff like that, that there are, hey, a guy can hope, can. right? <laughs> a guy can hope. So for those of you that are interested in moving on, um, there's a great variety of different kinds of series that are interesting, but we're just talking about the one, geometric. Okay, so now we're in section 12.6, which is called Newton's Method. <clears throat> so, okay, now, The machines that we build, right, like com computers and things like this and this calculator, right, in the end, all that they actually can do well, they, they, do, exactly, uh, they do exactly two things well, okay? They can add and they can do it very fast and they can multiply and they can do that very fast. And but as a consequence of those, they can also subtract because they can negate and then add. Okay. But dividing actually is much, much slower than multiplying. Dividing is much slower. But in the end, all of these fancy devices that we all love, the cell phones that a handful of you are operating, <laughs> computers, right, calculators, uh, all that they do is they do additions and multiplications very, very quickly. And then you can arrange these additions and multiplications into ways so that you can see cat videos on, on YouTube, you know, which in the end was, is the pinnacle of our society, right? Cat videos. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is by the end of today, by the end of today, we're going to be able to do the following. So. I have a button on my calculator, the square root button. And you could type in some number that doesn't have an integer square root, like 13. The square root of 13. The calculator reports 3 point whatever, whatever. How is the calculator doing that? I mean, this, in the end, all these machines can actually do is add and subtract and multiply. That's all that they can do. Is there some kind of magical square root dust that's inside of the calculator? Yes, that's, that's the answer. That, that's what it is. No. So how is, how is the calculator doing this? How does it do it? Okay, so then what we need to do today is we need to figure out, okay, just how is it doing that? Okay, furthermore, if you take some, some digits, Right, say like, and you type, say, 1 over 7. You type that into your calculator. It spits out those digits. That's not something that your calculator has memorized. It performed a computation and then printed them out. It, it had to compute something. How did it do that? 
Is it multiplying by a negative exponential or something? But that just, that just raises the question. It, in fact, begs the question of how do you do exponentiation? Because exponentiation is defined in terms of multiplication. Right. So you can't, you can't do exponentiation unt until you can multiply. Right, so I we have to. We, I thought we were running with the preface that it could multiply. You, you can, but but how would you how would you uh, do exponentiation? So, for example, x cubed is defined as x times x times x. Right. So, so x to ten, you take ten copies of x, x x x x x x x, right. ten of them. Okay, that seems reasonable enough. But how would you do, say, square root with a fractional exponent? Would you take half of an x? Okay, so it's, it's not clear what you would do. Sure. <laughs> so let's take see. Half of an x. That's <laughs> half an x, right? <laughs> x squared is you take two x's, right? <laughs> okay, so, <clears throat> so here's the idea. Uh, this is a proposition. So it's called Newton after that famous person. The Apple person. Sir Isaac, Sir Isaac Newton, the one that invented calculus, yes. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so here's the motivation for this. Suppose we have a plot of a function. I want to draw a little bit bigger than that. Okay, and the purpose is that we want to solve f of x is equal to 0. And that this red is a plot of f of x, of y is f of x. Okay, now, just visually, visually, does this plot have any solutions to f of x is equal to 0? Yes, it has these two solutions. Here's one solution, and here's another solution. But now we're going to run with a thought experiment that we don't have a plot, and we can't get a plot of the function. Okay? Well, all that we're going to do is just numerically. Right? If you wanted to explain, how, if you wanted to program a computer how to find that point, okay? how would you, in, in the quickest fashion possible. So this is the way it works is you say, okay, I want to find one of these two, but I don't know where they are. So I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess that, there is a, that this is a solution. So you can see, obviously, that it is not a solution. Okay, that's not a solution because it's not one of these two. So what we'll do is we'll say, okay, if we evaluate the function, then we get this point right here. And because that's above the x-axis, that's a positive value. So we know that, OK, that's not a solution. And if we call this point our guess, x1, then I'd like for you to observe the following. So in whatever drawing that you have, at this point where you guessed, please uh, draw the tangent line. So I'll draw a tangent line on my drawing. OK, now, from the tangent line, using the tangent line now, can you see a point which is a better guess than x1? Yes. What point? Move the tangent line across. Yeah, this is even a better guess, isn't it? So if we call this point x2, what I want you to observe 
is that x2 is better than x1. It's a better guess. So what, what, that, what I'm telling you is that if you had a guess x1, then you could, you could go to that point on the plot, attach the tangent line, and then, tr and then follow it back to get a better guess, x2. But then if you had an x2, you could do the same procedure to produce an x3, right? Because, because if you just continue this procedure one more time, say up and then, and then follow the tangent line back, ah, you can keep getting a better and better guess. Right? So then if x2 is not good enough, then find an x3 by following the tangent line. If x3 is not good enough, find an x4 by following the tangent line, etc. So what we want to do is we want to now, using this, this motivation, this drawing, we want to solve for x2. So now, this tangent line, this tangent line, uh, every line can be written as y minus y1 is m x minus x1. So every line, non-vertical line, can be written in this way. Okay, so then what is y1? We, we already know what x1 is. x1 is this value, but what's y1? It's f evaluated at x1. That's how high it, this point is. And what is, what is m, the slope of that blue line? Ah, that's, that, that won't help us. So we know what... What kind of line is this? This isn't just any old line. It's a tangent line, right? So what tells you the slope of a tangent line? Derivative, right? Derivative of f evaluated at x1. So we'll take this y minus y1 is mx minus x1, and we'll plug in this y1 and that m. So we get y minus f of x1 is <coughs> the derivative at x1 multiplied by x minus x1. So this is the equation of the tangent line. That's the equation of the tangent line. And now, that's all points on the tangent line satisfy that. So every one of the blue points satisfies this equation. But we're only interested in just one of the blue points, just that one right there. So what's, what is true about that blue point? x2 equals 0. It's not that x2 is 0. If x2 was 0, it would be over here. Oh. But something is 0. Why? Y is 0, right? Because it's at, its height is at 0. Oh. So that point right there, That point is the point x2, comma, 0. So if we plug in uh, x2, 0, then we would get 0 minus f of x1 is the derivative at x1 multiplied by x2 minus x1. So now we have an equation with x2 in it. So I plug in y is 0 and x is x2. So now let's solve for x2. What do we need to do? So I'll do one minor step. I'll drop that 0. Very good.
Okay, now what? Add x1. So if you had an x1, if you had a guess, then you can make a better guess by doing this with your x1, and you can make an x2. And if you wanted a better guess, then you could take your x2 and make an x3. So generally, the formula to get the next guess is that xn plus 1, the next guess, is the current guess, xn minus f evaluated at xn over the derivative evaluated at xn. And this is now a formula that you need to memorize. This is called Newton's method. Now you don't need to know the reason. It's good, it would be good for you to know the reason. But this is the formula that you need to know. In the end, the reason what it is is that you say, okay, I'll take my guess, I'll go up to the function, I'll attach the tangent line, I'll travel back to the x-axis, that's my next guess. And then continue over and over and over again. Okay, so here's a formula. Okay, so now we're going to do this. Uh, in the following exercise. <clears throat> so solve 3x cubed minus x squared plus 5x minus 12 equal to 0 on the interval 1 to 2 using Newton's method to four places past the decimal. That is to say that what I'm telling you is that that equation, that cubic, it has a solution between one and two, and I want you to find it using Newton's method. Okay, another comment I'd like to make is that, okay, uh, for, for quadratics, for polynomials of degree two, you can always find the exact solutions by just using the quadratic formula. And for linear equations, equations of degree one, you can always find it just using algebraic operations. So there's a quadratic formula, there's even a cubic formula, but I'd be willing to bet that none of you actually know it. I, I, I don't even know it, actually. <laughs> I know what it's called, so I could look it up. <laughs> but I don't have it memorized. It's, it's not one of the. It's named after someone. Yeah. Um, so, so you don't you don't have an analytic means to do it, but Newton's method can solve this for you. Okay. Now, to to use Newton's method, you need a function. What is the function? Very good. And because the formula is xn plus 1 is xn minus the function evaluated at xn over the derivative evaluated at xn, what else will we need? We'll also need the derivative. OK. <coughs> Well, what's the derivative? Okay, good. <laughs> the good old days. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the things that I actually like about calculus. That, that's not purely geometric. Okay, so then the update formula, the Newton update formula, is that xn plus 1 is xn and then minus 
3 xn cubed minus xn squared plus 5 xn minus 12 divided by <coughs> uh, 9 xn squared minus 2 xn plus 5. Okay, so that's, we're going to use this formula until we keep getting the same number for four places past the decimal. Okay, so in order to use this formula, we need a guess. And we're told that the solution we're looking for is between 1 and 2. So how about we use, how about we start with a guess of 1.5? Okay, so in and because we want four places past the decimal, I'll write 1.5000. Zero, zero, zero. So that's going to be guess number one. Okay. <clears throat> so the second guess is now I'm going to take this lovely expression here and I'm going to type it into the calculator. Okay, so see if you can get your calculator to do this. So the number I'm getting from my calculator is 1.3483. So are those, is that the same number as before? No, it's different, right? We started out with 1.5000. This is different. So that means... Oh, I get what you mean. You need to make those numbers small. Yes. Okay, good. Sorry, my, I wasn't clear. So now take, take this number and type it in to that expression. Now my calculator is reporting 1.3335. Okay, so our, is that the same as before? No. No, that's different. So now we need to type that the next one in. <clears throat> Well, I worked this example before, so I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm getting the right numbers. Yeah, I know it's the Yeah, it's not convenient. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, imagine, okay, that you were doing this back in the day, right? <laughs> At candle, by candlelight, because during the day, you, you know, you were trying to not die. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it, it would have been exciting. Okay, so to phrase your question differently, I think you're asking, is there a, is there a better way to make an intelligent first guess? Yes. And the answer is no. Well, the answer is yes, but but being able to make an intelligent first guess is, an, is 
requires training beyond what is available in this course, more or less, and is, and is highly problem dependent. So now we're getting uh, 1.3333. And then if you type this in, you'll get the same thing. Okay, so we're done, right? <coughs> so it turns out, okay, that if you, if you were typing this into your calculator and not rounding to four places, then your calculator would have gotten 1.33333 all threes. Okay, now, if, the, if that was actually a repeating three, one point repeating three, what number is that? One and a third, which is four thirds. That is, a, that is one of the solutions of this polynomial, four thirds. That is one of them. That's pretty neat, huh? You didn't even need to look at it, you didn't need a plot. Could have just figured it out. Now another thing. <clears throat> so that's the answer to the exercise. The chance of us not making a mistake with all of the typing in the calculator. You can do it. Wow. <laughs> I have I have faith in you. Like we could have started at one point three. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. That that would have worked. It, it, in fact, it, it, well, so, I'm pretty sure that you could have chosen any number between 1 and 2 and it would have worked. You wouldn't have gotten exactly these numbers, but no, it, sure. you but still would have ended up, up here. Place, yeah. But would it have taken less steps if we would have guessed better? I guess that's not that bad. Uh, it might have taken, instead of, I had, to, I had to get to, I had to make 1, 2, 3, 4 evaluations, you might have l gotten lucky and, get, and got it in 4. Maybe. Uh, now, your calculator, if you, have this, if you have this kind of calculator, then there's actually a shorter way to do this, a slightly shorter way to do this. <clears throat> and that is that you could type, so all the calculators th that are like this, they have this, this button right here says A and S, which means answer. So that's the previous numeric value. Mm -hmm. So A and S. Now you can use that as a variable and you can say, you can type this into your calculator, you can type A and S minus three times A and S cubed minus A and S <coughs> squared plus five times A and S minus 12 and then divide nine times a and s squared minus two times a and s plus five and then you only have to type that once and then you can just keep pressing enter so i'll i'll do that now so you replace all the x's with a and s Yeah, so you've got to type the first one and then and then start typing that in. Okay, so like on, on my calculator, just so you can see what I mean. So if I type 1.5 and then enter. So 1.5, that's, that's what A and S currently is. And then if I type this, this expression in right now, and then I just hit enter, then I get the first number. And if I, if I hit enter again, then I get the second number. If I hit enter again, the third number, and if I hit enter again, the fourth number. I assume we need to write, write down the next one. What are the visual? Yeah, I'll, I want you to write it down so that I can verify that. 
you, you've done something, or that you have excellent eyesight and you can see what your neighbor's writing or something. So I just need to see something. <clears throat> okay, any question about this? On the very first day. <laughs> well, because, because if you don't do it sort of the hard way, then doing it the easy way is less meaningful. I don't, I guess I don't understand that. But you haven't been quizzed over this. No, I'm just saying in the past, like if we had had that tool. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, you mean like on the annuities and things like that. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that too, you know. You know, and like you know, I have office hours, and I'd be glad to show you how to use your calculator <laughs> okay. efficiently. No, yeah, one class. Class. Yeah, one class. Yeah, one class in the final. Level. <laughs> well, I've been saying office hours all the time. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so now when we started this procedure, we said, okay, how does the calculator compute the square root of 13? How does it do that? So, let's. Let's compute the square root of 13 without the square root button. Okay? So the way we're going to do it uh, is like this. So if we wanted x is the square root of 13, if we wanted to figure out what that x was without any square roots, how could we write an equivalent equation that does not have any square roots in it? x squared is 13. And so I want you to take this equation and I want you to solve uh, solve to four places past the decimal or yeah four places past the decimal I guess is fine uh, using Newton's method. Okay, now to use Newton's method, you need a function. What will be our, what will be our function? X squared, minus X squared minus 13. The reason that is the case is because Newton's method solves for zeros. So you need something to be zero. So if you take this equation and move the 13 to the other side, then X squared minus 13 is zero. That's why it has to be this. So besides the function itself, what else do you need? Derivative. It's derivative. So then the update formula <coughs> is that xn plus 1 is uh, xn and then minus xn squared uh, minus 13 divided by 2xn. Now, you could use this formula. There'd be nothing wrong with that. But because we're going to type this into a calculator, and because I want to explain to you what exactly your calculator is doing, let's take this expression and simplify it a little bit so we don't have to be button mashing so much. Okay, so if we were to do that, this would be 2xn squared minus x n squared minus 13 over 2 x n. That's finding a common denominator. <clears throat> and then there are, I can simplify the numerator. Here's 2 x n squared minus 1 x n squared. So that would be <clears throat> x n squared and then minus negative 13. Or, yeah, that'd be plus 13 and then divide by 2xn and so now I'm going to divide this xn into the numerator and obtain the following that this is xn 
plus 13 over xn over 2. And this, or a slight variation on this, is what your calculator is using to compute square roots. So we need a guess. We need a guess for what, what will be our initial guess. Between three and four. Between three and four. That's, a, that's a very clever guess. Why is that, why is that a good guess? Because you know what square, I mean, you know what three squared and four squared are. Right. And you know they're on either side of 13. So. Right. So 13 is between 9 and 16. So the, squ the square root of 13 should be between 3 and 4. So that's pretty clever. And I'll, I'll say that's beyond the cleverness of your calculator. So feel free to guess that. Uh, but I'm just going to guess that the answer is 1. That's going to be my initial guess. Maybe it's 1. By the way, this is called, this formula is so famous that it has a name. It's called the divide and average formula. Because you take, you're trying to compute the square root of 13, so you divide it by your guess, and then average it with, compute the average of that with your previous guess. Okay, so now I'm going to do the same, the same thing and find x2 and x3 and everything else. Okay. So what I'm, for, you know, for your knowledge, in my calculator, what I'm typing is I'm typing a and s plus 13 over a and s, and then over 2, like this. <clears throat> okay, and I have to initialize it by giving 1. Okay, so there's 1. Okay, so then uh, my next guess, x2, was 7. So that's not right. Okay, my next guess is 4.42. 4, 2, 8, 6 or so. My next guess is... Three point six eight two zero. My next guess is three point six zero six three. My next guess is three point six zero oh five six. And that's also my next guess. OK. So six evaluations is what it, it took to where the, the four digits past the decimal stopped changing. OK, now go ahead now and use your calculator and type the square root of 13. What does it say? Ah, interesting. <laughs> so, is that surprising? I hope not, because, because I, I told you this is the way that your calculator is computing square roots. It's just doing it faster than you can mash the buttons with your fingers. It's, it's doing exactly this, this divide and average formula, and it's doing it until the digits stay the same, and then it prints out the result. So now, uh, you know, if it, if it really came down to it, you could, you could now compute the square root of something without the square root button. <laughs> That's exciting. People used to need to do this to compute square roots. And people carefully did it by hand and put them into tables and bound them into books and sold them for money.
And the pirates use them. <laughs> to navigate across the 